Yes, as your last point, I hope. Um, my Lord, yes, although it may take some explanation, but uh, I realised with something that my Lord asked me about what was argued below that may not have been appreciated with respect. Below, the parties only addressed the question of whether, in principle, substantial nominal damages were occurred. There was no argument about if it were substantial, where would the cutoff fall? And I can give you the reference, I may not need to turn it up, but the parties in their pleadings before the deputy judge essentially said if you need to hear detail about where the cutoff would be, that could go off to another hearing. And the reference. That's quite appalling. Uh, to think of public money being spent on three days at first instance and then not completing it. It's just awful. My this Lord, is all public money, isn't it? My Lord, could, could I explain that, that there were a, a number of points below that are not being addressed here that were actually quite important points of principle. So, for example... And even we are taking two days. My Lord, yes, and we do say with great respect that these are important points of principle on EU law and there were distinct points in addition to those on whether an anterior public law error in an immigration decision. Anyhow, yeah, uh, the judge has dealt with it, and we must deal with it too. But, but, but the point I make is was sim simply this, just to point out that the reason why there were no detailed submissions below on where any cutoff would fall, and that's not analysed in the judgment, is because both parties took the position below that if there needed to be detailed submissions on cut-off points. These cases just continue. become endless. My Lord, I, 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 I simply wish to explain the basis on which yeah, the proceedings well. below happen. And the, the references, if it's helpful, is a defendant's skeleton before the deputy judge, core bundle, page 247, in particular the last line of page of paragraph 69. Well, I didn't mean Nico, but yes, we've yeah. got to deal with so, it. Yes. So, so I, just, I, I just simply wanted to point out that unless the court is of a view that the defendant is right that the whole of period two must be nominal damages, or conversely, that the whole of period two must be substantial damages. On the question of where a cutoff would fall, the court would be acting as a first instance court. Uh, it may be that the court would think that's not for us, or it may be given the indication. I'd like to speak with a very broad brush indeed. This litigation okay. must come to an end. Certainly, the Lord. So, in that case, the, the question for the court then is what could and would this what would and could the Secretary of State have done? The question of what could the Secretary of State have done is measured by a strict necessity test and also by Secretary of State's ordinary public law duties, including compliance with policy. On the strict necessity test, in particular, we say it's important to note that if events happen earlier, then, absent any reason to the contrary, the logical inference is you move everything forward. And so the particular facts that we say would happen earlier, just to be clear, the notice of liability to deport could have been given in June 2014, or some shortly thereafter when there's the plea of guilty, not the 30th of January 2015. The EEA questionnaire could have gone in June 2014, not waited until the 12th of February 2015. The OASIS and the PSR, the, sorry, I beg your pardon, the pre-sentence report, as we saw, were in existence on the 31st of December 2014, could have been obtained shortly thereafter. And the last element of a jigsaw puzzle that could have moved forward would be um, contact with social services, could have happened far earlier. So once, this, once the claimant is asked to provide information, he'll say, I've got the son. At that point, you can contact social services. When did it happen? The 21st of February. So we do say it's quite proper, particularly on the strict necessity test, to infer that uh, the decision to deport could have been taken very shortly. Well, after sentencing, point, yes. after sentencing. Now, I mean, is there anything else? Yes, and, and the last point is this, is the, in a sense our fallback would be if you're not with us, that it would happen almost immediately after sentencing. Then 
we point to this policy. And, and can I show you where it is? It's in Authority Volume 2, Tab 44. And this is about EEA nationals, such as the claimants, detained under Regulation 24.1, the last tab of Authority 2. So, and Regulation 24.1 is, of course, the power that applied to the claimant's detention throughout periods one and two. So it's the power to detain while the Secretary of State is considering whether to proceed with deportation. And you'll see, first of all, if you look at the internal pagination, page six, uh, so there's a, there's a list of forms, and then above that, you see a, a, sent a paragraph, four paragraph down to reduce the risk of challenge. You must only detain the FNO when absolutely necessary and for as short as time as possible. And then if you turn on to page 10, second paragraph down, in criminal casework, deten uh, the, the maximum acceptable period of detention under Regulation 24.1 of the EEA Regulations 2006 is considered to be 15 calendar days. By the end of 15 calendar days, the decision on whether deportation is to be pursued should have been made. If exceptionally the investigation is not concluded, you can apply a further period of detention in the 15 calendar days, uh, but should, must not last longer than 30 days in total. And we, um, we emphasize, again, the lack of witness evidence. There is nothing to suggest, if the court is making that evaluative exercise itself, nothing to suggest that there were exceptional circumstances that would have just justified a period beyond 15 days. So, of course, the policy can't extend the boundaries of the reasonable exercise of the power to detain, but it certainly can limit them. So, in terms of what the Secretary of State could lawfully have done, we say strict necessity test, get on with it, all the information could be obtained far earlier, could have happened very shortly after the sentencing on the 27th of January. Right to say, we say, that the whole of period two therefore gives rise to substantial damages on our respondent's notice point that everything gets accelerated if the Secretary of State does his job properly. But even if you're not with us on that, the outer limit of how long the Secretary of State could lawfully have taken in the absence of exceptional circumstances uh, was 15 days. And that was not and, a matter put to the judge, okay? And, and, and my lord, no, it's not. And, and for a number of reasons. I mean, we, we, do, we do respect you saying this is not a criticism of Mr. Stanton, but it is for the Secretary of State to also highlight its own policies. But, uh, I mean, one thing I should also explain is that our understanding, actually, is that there are two policies that coexist and that apply to EA National. So the Chapter 55 policy that you were shown yesterday does apply to EA Nationals because there's actually a reference in the policy, which I'll be given in a moment, uh, to EA Nationals. Oh, yes, it's... I'll just give you the page reference. So Chapter 55, the general policy you saw yesterday, paragraph 55.9.5, um, and that's at tab 42, page 41, shows that the two policies coexist. And in fact, we've got a further indication of that in correspondence with the Secretary of State that is in supplementary bundle at page 315. So we, and far from this being something that we've just come up with on the hoop today, um, we, we, from the 30th of October, wrote, I think, so. So, I beg your pardon, on the 11th of October 2018, wrote to the Secretary of State saying, what's this policy? Did it, did, did it apply? Tell, tell us how these policies interact. Secretary of State writes back on the 31st, and that's page 315 of supplementary bundle, saying, yes, this policy has been enforced since January 2014, although the full details can be found in Chapter 55. So, two policies simultaneously applicable 
although only EEA nationals have the benefit of this policy. And uh, we uh, also... The date of the EIG at, uh, at, at uh, 42... Presumably, it was well before the uh, document you're now showing us of January 2014. Um, th there are many iterations of this policy. So, Chapter 55, this particular one, you can actually see that the draft you've got in the, uh, you can see the revision history actually at page 64 of Bundle 42. So this one seems to come into existence on the 30th of January 2015, this particular iteration of the policy. Um, but if I can be permitted to, to say from knowledge of these cases that this is a later iteration of a policy that had been replicated repeatedly. So it is, it is essentially sitting there. Uh, I think that's, I think that's not controversial. Yes, it's fair to say that Chapter 55 has been in place for, for a long time. This is the version that was in place at the relevant time for the purposes of this appeal. Yes. yes. Right. Right, well, thank you. So, reply on uh, your appeal, uh, Mr. Anderson. Very briefly, then, my lord. Obviously, I have no reply in relation to the appeal in respect to my ability. The court didn't You're right about that. To yes. call upon my learned friends to address it. Um, so, um, uh, in relation to quantum, I just have a few very brief points. First, I don't, with respect to my learned friend, understand how the unpacking of the breach in the present case identifies a breach that is any different from the other inquire and consider duties that I took you to as illustrations. That's my first point of reply. Uh, second, I don't accept that a number of the arguments that are or have been presented to the court um, in relation to whether the Secretary of State could and would lawfully uh, have been detained are arguments that have been properly articulated in terms of the claimant's pleaded case. The claimant appears to be relying upon a slew of new arguments as to why detention during period two is said to be unlawful. So the claimant now says that the necessity test in EU law meant that the defendant had to have issued requests for information about the detainee's circumstances back at the point uh, of his guilty plea. That's not a point that was argued before. I don't accept the respect that it's a point that, argue, that, that, that emerges either from the paperwork and the appeal. Um, and certainly I don't accept that it's the sort of point that this court should be entertaining when it hasn't been raised in the court below. Uh, similarly, in relation to the um, challenge based on the um, policy, uh, on which I would observe that the period of detention in this case does fall within the 30 days that the policy allows for. In any event in my submission, there's absolutely no authority that would suggest that application of the test of necessity in EU law meant that the Secretary of State had to have gathered all of the information relevant to the decision to remove before the custodial uh, sentence had expired, which appears to be my learned friend's submission. The breach on the basis of which, of, e of EU law, on the basis of which the judge found detention to be unlawful, was the failure to have the information that was sufficient to satisfy requirements of an individualized consideration in light of the circumstances of the offense rather than the um, fact of um, uh, conviction. Uh, it wasn't broader than that. Um, and, and in those circumstances, uh, in my submission, the court should entertain or at any event should reject the arguments that the claimant now seeks to advance um, as to why necessity or policy would have meant that the claimant couldn't have been detained for the duration of period two. 
In terms of the um, suggestion that it's a matter of which further evidence might be required, I simply make the point that the defendant's primary case was that the court had sufficient information in order to determine um, the question of whether or not the detention could and would lawfully have been detained, and that remains the defendant's um, case. Um, this litigation does need to, uh, to conclude. Um, my Lord, unless there are any uh, particular points that you would like me to address you on, uh, those well, are my just about this last viewpoint, the uh, policy of 15 or 30 days in exceptional circumstances. Yes. What's the relationship of that and the uh, uh, earlier policy? Well, in relation to EEA nationals, they are subject to the, um, uh, the policy for detention under Regulation 24.1. That's the policy that's specific in relation to the yeah. exercise of the power to detain whilst considering deportation. The reference that I made to the other policy, Chapter 55, was essentially illustrative in terms of the fact that the offence in the present case was one considered to be particularly serious. I didn't seek to rely and don't seek to rely upon the policy for anything more than... Uh, but is there that. not a possible argument? I think since it's a new point, we may have to determine whether or not it's allowable at this stage. Uh, but if we were to allow it, um, to the effect that uh, 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 if... Uh, you had uh, uh, performed your function properly, you would have done it in accordance with this uh, 2014 policy and um, uh, would have made a decision within, at any rate, 15 days and uh, the whole matter would have been accelerated uh, to that extent. Well, my Lord, I'd say there are two prob problems in relation to the, the, the claim of succeeding in relation to that argument. First, I've already addressed, which is my, my pleading point, essentially. It wasn't pleaded below. I don't accept that it's been pleaded no, before this court either. Yes. Um, uh, the second um, is that, of course, you have to bear in mind that in terms of the period of detention, the claimant uh, was given 10 days in which to make representations. And I think my learned friend is right. The questionnaire uh, isn't provided until a little after that, but it's completed on the same day, so that doesn't add any time. Uh, but the claimant was given 10 calendar days and asked for, um, uh, and asked for more time. Um, uh, and there were further inquiries um, to, to be made. I, I would say this is plainly a case in which if you look at the facts of what happened, yeah. um, it would have been legitimate to continue detention after 15 days. I mean, where an individual asks for more time to make representations, um, it would be, it, it can't be right that the Secretary of State's choices then either don't allow them any additional time or release them. Uh, that, that wouldn't promote um, fairness. Uh, or but the other thing, the other policy, uh, if... Um I, I think, my Lord, if the breach was said to be that, for example, there wasn't a review within 15 days, and there should have been a review within 15 days, then the counterfactual would be, well, what if you had reviewed within uh, 15 days? And if the answer to that question is, it would have been the same outcome, then if the answer to that question were different, if the answer to that question were, well, uh, th th then it would be different. It all goes back to the difference between um, uh, the parties on... Uh, right, well, thank you. Uh, thank you both for your submissions. We'll reserve judgment and uh, you'll get the draft in uh, due course. Uh, we'll be grateful for typographical corrections, but no others. And, uh,